Crime and Crime Again discusses true crime content that may be graphic or disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. College can be an opportunity for self-discovery and exploration, for soaking in that first taste of independence and freedom. Kristen Mottaferi had just finished her freshman year at North Carolina State University as an industrial design major, and she was eager for adventure. Confident that she could further her education, travel across the country, and entirely support herself in the process, Kristen had made big plans for the summer of 1997. Born on June 1, 1979, Kristen was the second oldest of four girls. Though she was born in Connecticut, she spent most of her life in North Carolina. Her father, Bob, worked as an electrical engineer, and her mother, Debbie, was a teacher. Not much else is known about Kristen's life prior to her starting college, but it seems that she had a happy, enriching upbringing. Kristen had always been an incredibly bright girl. Brilliant, really. During elementary school, she had actually skipped a grade, which meant she graduated high school as one of the youngest in her class and completed her first year of college at 17 years old. Kristen was attending North Carolina State University as a Park Scholar. She had been a straight-A student all throughout her school years and achieved a near-perfect score on her SATs. The Park Scholarship is awarded to NC State students of exceptional character and academic performance. Very few students are awarded the scholarship each year. In Kristen's freshman class at NC State, she was among the only 25 students to be named a Park Scholar. In her first year of college, she had again achieved straight A's. On June 1, 1997, which also happened to be her 18th birthday, Kristen flew from North Carolina to San Francisco, California in preparation for the summer photography class she would be taking at the University of California at Berkeley. In the weeks before she arrived in San Francisco, Kristen had already managed to find a room at a home in Oakland, California, where she would be living with four roommates. Within days of her arrival, Kristen had already landed a job at Spinelli's, a coffee shop in Crocker Galleria, which is a three-story shopping mall in the financial district of San Francisco. She worked at Spinelli's from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. during the week, and not long after starting this job, she started a second job at another cafe during the weekends. This cafe was located at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Kristen already had an immensely busy schedule, and her summer course hadn't even begun yet. On June 23, 1997, Kristen clocked into work at Spinelli's at 7 a.m., as usual. At some point during her shift, she asked coworkers for directions to Land's End Beach, about a 40-minute commute by bus. Kristen didn't have her own car, so she primarily used public transportation to get from place to place. At 3 p.m., Kristen clocked out of work and left the coffee shop. However, about 45 minutes later, coworkers happened to see Kristen walking around the second floor of the mall, and she wasn't alone. It was already unusual that she had stuck around the mall after leaving work. She was typically off to explore and do other things rather than wander around the mall. She was seen walking around with an unknown blonde woman, who some witnesses say was carrying a green Jansport backpack, much like Kristen's. Surveillance cameras captured Kristen leaving the Crocker Galleria alone, after having withdrawn some money from an ATM. Kristen's manager also stated that he was certain he spotted Kristen leaving alone, and not with the blonde woman. To this day, that blonde woman has never come forward, and has never been identified. The next day, on June 24, 1997, the photography course at UC Berkeley began. Kristen never showed up. She also didn't show up for her shift at Spinelli's, and never picked up her last paycheck but it would be at least another 24 hours before anyone was aware that Kristen was officially missing. During the three weeks Kristen had spent in Oakland and San Francisco so far, and despite her packed schedule, she always found time to call her parents and let them know how she'd been doing, the new places she'd been exploring, and tell them about friends she'd made. 
Her parents had tried to call her that day, June 23rd, but there was no answer when they called her home in Oakland. They knew that she was always on the go, so they didn't think much of it at the time. On June 25th, Kristen's father Bob called the house again, and when there was still no answer, he left a message with one of her roommates. The roommate assured Bob that as soon as Kristen came home, they would have her call back. Kristen never came home. Quote, She called a couple of days before she disappeared, to tell us what a great time she was having, and how wonderful San Francisco was. And all of a sudden, she goes to work, clocks out at 3 p.m., and that's it. We don't know what happened at that point. End quote. This is how Bob recalled the last time he spoke to Kristen, in the America's Most Wanted episode that covered her case. After more than 48 hours since anyone had last seen or heard from Kristen, one of her roommates contacted her family and alerted them that Kristen had not returned home or shown up to work in two days. Bob and Debbie Modafferi arrived in San Francisco on June 27, 1997, to begin their search for their daughter. Early on, the Modafferis put up a $10,000 reward for information about Kristen's disappearance. Because Kristen lived in Oakland, it was the Oakland Police Department that was assigned to her case. Officers interviewed Kristen's co-workers at Spinelli's to try to paint a clearer picture of her activities on June 23rd. This is when they learned about Kristen having asked for directions to Land's End Beach, and about the blonde woman she had been spotted walking and talking with 45 minutes after her shift ended. It's uncertain what Kristen's intentions at the beach were, as she never specified them to anyone. Some suspected she may have been planning to attend a party, while most believe it's more likely that she wanted to visit that particular beach to take photographs of the scenic coastline. Upon interviewing everyone they could find who was connected to Kristen, police quickly realized that they had no solid leads. Within days of Kristen's disappearance, investigators brought in bloodhounds to attempt to track her scent to potential locations of interest. The dogs were able to track Kristen's scent from the Crocker Galleria where she worked to a bus stop on Gary Street, about a seven-minute walk for Kristen from the Galleria. That bus stop was for the 38 bus, which would have taken Kristen to another bus stop right near the Sutro Baths, close to the Land's End area that she had been asking for directions to that day. In the episode of Unsolved Mysteries that highlighted Kristen's case, the investigator and handler of one of the tracking dogs noted, quote, When we were downtown, I could tell he was on a trail. He knew exactly where he was going. Every turn was perfect. End quote. The Sutro Baths are a public swimming facility that began in 1863. Most of what was the swimming facility now sits in ruins on the coastline, marked by graffiti and romantic sentiments carved into the cliffside. The bloodhounds tracked Kristen's scent to the ruins of the Sutro Baths, as well as to a short tunnel that runs under the cliffside. Both of these locations would have made for excellent photographs, and it's suspected that that is exactly why Kristen went there that day. Her photography course was set to start the next day. She was likely preparing some new shots to bring to class with her. Kristen's scent abruptly stopped at the coastline, as though she had been standing along the edge of the rocks, taking panoramic photos of the ocean and the rocky shore. This beach wasn't an area where people would gather to tan along the shore or jump into the water for a swim in the crisp coastal air. The shoreline was rough and treacherous, and the cresting waves were cold and powerful known to knock people off of their feet during higher tides, when they crashed onto the rocky lookout where tourists gathered. Authorities, however, believed it to be unlikely that Kristen had simply fallen into the water. The area was a popular tourist attraction, especially in the middle of summer, and if someone had fallen into the ocean and drowned, there would certainly have been witnesses. Kristen's scent was also traced to Cliff House, a large historical building perched on the cliffs overlooking the Sutro Bath ruins. At the time, Cliff House served as a restaurant and gift shop. The dogs were able to trace Kristen's scent all around the Sutro Baths area, but from there, her trail disappeared. It was uncertain how she left the area or where she had gone. On July 10, 1997, 17 days after Kristen vanished, investigators were alerted to a break in the case. An anonymous caller told ABC7 News that he knew exactly what happened to Kristen Modafferi. He claimed that he knew the identities of the two women who abducted and murdered Kristen, and that they had left her body under a bridge in Marin County, just over an hour away from San Francisco. 
The caller went on to say that the two women killed Kristen as a result of a love affair gone awry. The two women who the caller named were tracked down immediately, and they had intriguing and alarming information for investigators. They adamantly denied the allegations, and they knew exactly who had called in the anonymous tip. John Onuma. Investigators located John Onuma and sat him down for questioning. Initially, he denied having any knowledge of Kristen's disappearance and denied having made the anonymous phone call. Soon enough, however, he cracked. He admitted to making the phone call, and he told authorities that he had made the call out of anger after learning that the two women were allegedly trying to get his girlfriend, Jill Lampo, fired from her job. Onuma insisted that the call was nothing more than a hoax, a senseless reaction fueled by anger. But investigators remained suspicious. When they dug further into John Onuma's life, they gathered more information and evidence that would keep their sights set on him. Several former girlfriends of Onuma came forward to share information about Onuma's character and behavior, and they had a laundry list of reasons why investigators should not clear Onuma so quickly. Investigators learned that Onuma was notorious for finding and meeting women through various forms of personal ads, whether in the newspaper or online, and according to his former girlfriends, nothing good ever came of it. In the America's Most Wanted episode, one former girlfriend, who met Onuma through a voicemail service, stated, quote, He can manipulate you, break you down emotionally, break you down mentally. He's just a human vampire who will suck the life out of you. End quote. Another former girlfriend alleged that Onuma treated her, quote, like his little sex slave, end quote, and that he would starve and beat her. She stated that on one occasion, he burned her hand with a cigarette. Perhaps the most disturbing account from Onuma's former girlfriends was the one from someone who had been involved with Onuma a few months after Kristen disappeared. In the America's Most Wanted episode, she recalled, quote, He hit me over the head with ropes and said, You know I'm going to have to kill you. I can't let you go. Now you know what happened to Kristen Modafferi, end quote. When investigators searched the home of Onuma's most recent girlfriend, again, Jill Lampo, they discovered Lampo's journal and perused it as potential evidence. They discovered that several pages of the journal had been torn out. Pages dated from the same time period that Kristen had been in San Francisco. Lampo told investigators that it was John Onuma who had torn out those pages. In the Unsolved Mysteries episode, Onuma sat down to speak about his connection to Kristen's case, his face obscured in shadow and his voice distorted. Quote, I've never met Kristen. I never saw her. There's absolutely no connection to Kristen and I in any way. End quote. He goes on to say that he regrets ever making the anonymous phone call and that what he did that day was wrong. Although investigators have never found concrete or forensic evidence to connect Onuma to Kristen's disappearance, he has remained a person of interest in the case. He is, however, not an official suspect in the disappearance of Kristen Modafferi. Over the next several months, investigators were still unable to find any indication or evidence of what may have happened to Kristen. The possibility of her leaving her life voluntarily was quickly ruled out. Kristen was ecstatic about the summer she would spend in San Francisco. She had remained in contact with her family right up until her disappearance. She was working two jobs to be able to pay her bills, and she was due to begin a photography course that she was thrilled about. Kristen was completely set up. She had no intentions of running away from her life. In May 1998, almost one year after Kristen disappeared, investigators discovered potentially crucial evidence in the case. Upon re-examining all of the evidence gathered during the course of the 11-month investigation, authorities discovered something that had been overlooked before. In a trash can taken from Kristen's room, they discovered a local newspaper, The Bay Guardian. In the paper was a personal ad that had been circled, presumably by Kristen. The ad was published in the June 11th issue of the paper, and it said, quote, Friends, female seeking friends to share activities who enjoy music, photography, working out, walks, coffee, or simply the beach, exploring the Bay Area. Interested? Call me. End quote. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that this ad had been put in the paper using a special promotion for free personal ads that the Bay Guardian had been offering the week prior to Kristen's disappearance. 
When Kristen's family read the ad, it immediately struck them. Quote, if you read it, it sounds like it could be Kristen. It's all the kind of things she was interested in. It's photography, walking the city, music, art, end quote. Kristen's dad noted in the Unsolved Mysteries episode. By the time investigators discovered the ad, it was too late to determine whether the ad had in fact been placed by Kristen herself, or whether she had simply circled it because she responded to it, or was planning on responding to it. The Bay Guardian had already purged that information from their records. In July 1998, the Modiferis increased the reward to $25,000 for information about Kristen's disappearance. A few months later, they doubled the reward to $50,000, and that reward still stands today. In 2006, almost 10 years after Kristen's disappearance, the FBI opened a criminal kidnapping investigation on Kristen's case. Over the years, there have been suspicions that Kristen's case could be linked to suspected serial killer Robert Durst, though no solid evidence has been found to support this, and authorities have concluded that there is no connection between Kristen Modafferi and Robert Durst. For several years, there were no breaks and no new information in Kristen's case. That is, however, until June 2015, when Paul Dosti, a private investigator hired by the Modafferi family, did some digging into the case. Dosti brought his 11-year-old cadaver dog to the home on Jane Avenue in Oakland, California, where Kristen had been living at the time of her disappearance. Cadaver dogs are trained specifically to detect the scent of human decomposition. The dog alerted to the basement of the home. Soil samples from the basement were collected, but no other evidence of a body or of Kristen was found. In February 2017, Dosti returned to Kristen's former home, this time with Dr. Arpad Voss, a forensic anthropologist who specializes in human decomposition. Dr. Vass determined that an area between Kristen's former home and the house next door, at the base of a set of stairs outside of Kristen's home, was of interest. He collected DNA evidence, most likely human blood, that was determined to be a match to Kristen. This testing was done using technology designed by Dr. Vass that was still awaiting patent review at the time that this news broke. However, four years later, and there is still no update regarding this DNA evidence. In 2000, President Bill Clinton signed Kristen's Act into law. Kristen's law was established to provide more resources for missing persons cases of those over age 17 and allotted $1 million per year toward those resources. However, the federal funding for Kristen's law halted when the law expired in 2005. In December 2000, the Kristen Foundation was established as a nonprofit organization to provide funding and resources toward missing persons cases like Kristen's. June 23, 2021, the day that this episode goes live, will mark 24 years since Kristen Modafferi disappeared. No arrests have ever been made and no charges have ever been brought in the disappearance of Kristen Modafferi. At the time of her disappearance, Kristen Deborah Modafferi was 18 years old, 5 feet 8 inches tall, and approximately 140 pounds. She has dark brown hair and brown eyes, and distinctive dimples in her cheeks when she smiles. When she left the Crocker Galleria just after 3.45 p.m. on June 23, 1997, Kristen was wearing a black Spinelli Coffee Company t-shirt, tan pants, a blue plaid flannel shirt, and what are thought to be Fly London sneakers. She was carrying a green Jansport backpack containing two library books and her camera. If you have any information on the disappearance of Kristen Modafferi, please contact the Oakland Police Department at 510-238-3641. If you enjoy the show, please do consider leaving a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts as it really, really helps out with the visibility of the show. If you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, but you would still like to leave a review, you can do that on Podchaser by searching Crime and Crime Again. I will also link it in the show notes. If you'd like to show monetary support for the show, you can do so on Buy Me a Coffee, where you can make a one-time donation less than the price of one cup of coffee. I will also leave that link in the show notes. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Crime Again Pod, Instagram at Crime Again Podcast, on Facebook, Crime and Crime Again Podcast, and on TikTok 
at Crime Again Podcast. There is also a Facebook discussion group, which I will link in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode of Crime and Crime Again.